our musical item um, at midday today, so please yeah. feel free to join us. I've often heard the term socks appeal, <laughs> but <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what it meant until I met our speaker this morning. Um, he has toned it down a bit this morning because, they, you know, with the light outside and thing, you know, it might distract from his encouragement. But apart from that, I have the distinct pleasure of assisting this gentleman on a Thursday morning when he conducts his discourse on Troward's um, creative principle in the individual, creative process in the individual. And I assure you, there's more to him than his socks. <laughs> he has a way of saying, quite sincerely, here I am, God. Send me. And believe it, this man is sent to bring this teaching to us. So please, pay close attention and welcome to the podium, Reverend John Scott. Thank you, Stevie, and good morning, family and friends. And good morning to those who join us on the internet, and a special welcome to our first-time visitors. And if you miss one of these two gorgeous picnics in the front, don't call the police. Uncle Boulding will make me bring her back, or them back, um, quietly. They're gorgeous. CBS News reports that it is 30 years ago today March 15, 1985, that the first dot-com domain was registered, changing, well, changing everything. Quote, in the last 30 years, the internet has evolved from an unknown phenomenon used primarily by academics and researchers to a global communication, commerce, and information sharing channel that few could imagine life without said Versign, a leading seller of domain names. Quote, in fact, nearly three billion people around the world are online today, and more than $300 billion in US e-commerce sales, and over 1.3 trillion in global e-commerce sales rely on the internet. Unquote. 30 years. 3 billion people, $1.3 trillion, largely attributable to three little letters. Now defunct Massachusetts computer company, Symbolics, registered the first dot-com domain, Symbolics.com, on March 15, 1985. Though its machines are long dead, the site lives on. The World Wide Web, which we use to access the information on the internet, didn't even exist yet. It wasn't launched until 1991. It would take until 1987 for the total number of dot-com domains to reach 100. Yet today, there's a dot-com registered every second. That's more than 80,000 dot-com domains per day. I received a few years ago an amusing version of the origin of the computer, and I wanted to share it with you this morning. In ancient Israel, it came to pass that a trader by the name of Abraham Com, did take unto himself a young wife by the name of Dot. Now Dot Com was a comely woman, broad of shoulder and long of leg, Indeed, she had been called Amazon Dot. <laughs> she said unto Abraham, her husband, Darling, why dost thou travel from town to town with thy goods when thou can trade without ever leaving thy tent? And Abraham did look at her as though she were several saddlebags short of a camel load, but simply said, How oh dear. And Dot replied, I will place drums in old towns and drums in between to send messages saying that you 
or what you have for sale, and they will reply telling you what hath the best price. And the sale can be made on the drums and delivery made by Uriah's Pony Stable, UPS for short. <laughs> Abraham thought long and hard and decided he would let Dot have her way with the drums. The drums rang out and they were, they was, they were an, an immediate success. Abraham sold all the goods he had at the top price without ever moving from his tent. But this success did arouse envy. A man named Maccabeer did secrete himself inside Abraham's drum and was accused of insider trading. <laughs> and the young man did take to dot coms trading as doth the greedy horsefly take to horse flesh. And before long, there were many others, and they were called nomadic, ecclesiastical, rich Dominican Siderites, or nerds for short. <laughs> and lo, the land was so feverish with joy at the new riches and the deafening sound of the drums that no one noticed that the real riches were going to the drum maker, one brother, William of Gates, <laughs> who bought every drum company in the land and indeed did insist on making drums that would work only with Brother Gates' drum heads and drumsticks. Dot did say, oh Abraham, what we have started is being taken over by others. And as Abraham looked over the Bay of Ezekiel, or as it came to be known, eBay, he said, and I quote, we need a name that reflects what we are. And Dot replied, yes, darling, young, ambitious Hebrew owner operators, Yahoo, <laughs> for short. And that is how it all began. It wasn't Al Gore after all. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, my friends, how the universe moves to support an idea whose time has come? And in 30 short years, the internet literally has taken over the way we live our lives, and the way we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So you know, from time to time, we talk from the platform about this business of setting intention. I think Reverend Michael mentioned it last week. And he and I, Reverend Michael Record and I, have, as you know, shared stories from time to time concerning our experience conducting weekly classes at the Adult Correctional Facility here in Kingston. The classes titled Change Your Thinking change your life, aim at teaching participants the SOM, Science of Mind Principles, which they can utilize to improve their lives. One of the areas participants find fascinating is this matter of how the universe moves to support our deepest desires and intention. And we recently had an example of this, which I wanted also to share with you this morning. Every week, we present ourselves at the Adult Correctional Facility on a Tuesday afternoon. And our usual place for conducting our classes is in the chapel, which is a large, cavernous building that could hold, I don't know, 300 people, maybe. It's really big. And from as early as after our third class, we're into our fifth class now, Reverend Michael said, you know, this facility has 1,600 men. And we are here training 8 or 10 or 12 on a Tuesday. Why don't they give us 30 um, uh, men? And we would just dip, take two ends of the, of the chapel and have two classes running simultaneously. So we propose this to the prison uh, officials. But it hasn't happened. But having set our intention, Reverend Michael and myself turn up every Tuesday promptly at 1 o'clock for our class. Well, friends, two Tuesdays ago, I arrived ahead of Reverend Michael and was told that the chapel, which we usually use, wasn't available. The computer lab, which is one of our alternate venues, wasn't available. The band's room, where the band loudly practices, and they've gotten better over the year, wasn't available. So it looks as if we were going to have to abandon the class until the lady at the front desk that processes us when we arrive said, oh, I think there is a classroom in the school complex, and I think you can have it. So I was escorted to the school complex uh, to 
it, it's like about five classrooms, eh? And there was one empty. So I'm sitting there waiting with the guard assigned to me, sitting near to me. And the loudspeakers are saying, inmates for Reverend John Scott report to the school. So I thought, okay, inmates assigned to me has report to the school. Okay, just d breathe deeply and ignore the heat and um, the noise around from the other classrooms. And I'm sitting there in a kind of semi-meditative state when in walks a gentleman in the khaki pants and white shirt, which is the uniform of residents of that facility. And he says to me, what do you say your class is about? So I said, you ever had anybody ask you what your, what your religion is about? And you have a moment of panic. <laughs> what am I going to tell them? <laughs> and they say, I hear you're a cult, you know, and you have to say, no, no, a cult is, a, is a, a movement built around the personality of one person whose dictates are followed without question. No, we're not a cult. We are a movement that follows the teachings of Jesus the Christ, but honors all paths to God. So he says to me, so what you say your class is about? And for a moment, that old race belief thing, you know, what do I tell him? Um, gripped my stomach, and then I just very calmly explained to him what we were doing. I said, we teach them about the law of attraction and lead them through an exercise that gives them the opportunity to determine their life purpose. His eyes were wide. I said, sometimes we talk about blame, shame, and forgiveness, and the power of forgiveness. And we determine together that this cannot be the end for people in here. There must be something greater and bigger and more wonderful for them to achieve. Mark you, many of them find their purpose in that facility. They find that they have talents that they never knew before and that they wouldn't possibly have discovered if they hadn't been incarcerated. But be that as it may, after I had finished explaining to him, he said, this is wonderful. I thought, well, you're not only handsome, you're bright. <laughs> he exclaimed that this was just what he had been looking for. And then said, you know, I teach the class on entrepreneurship. Because I believe when we get out of here, we need to be able to do something to help ourselves. I said, indeed. He said, but what you are doing sounds like it is even more important than entrepreneurship. Would you allow my students to attend your class? I said, with great pleasure, how many students you have? He said, 20 in one class and 25 in another. <laughs> Reverend Michael and I have been trying to get the authorities to assign us um, students from last year. But this is not the end of this amazing story of synchronicity. The correctional officer assigned to Reverend Michael and I to escort us was listening to this interchange. And he said to me, why don't you email me an outline of the program so I can promote it in the ver on the various cell blocks? So said, so done. So in about 10 or 15 minutes, we have moved from being unable to, to find more than eight or 12 students to two classes, both of maybe 20 or uh, 15 or 20 people each. You know, friends, when that entrepreneur teacher said, so what do you say your, your class is about? It took me straight to a question that the master teacher Jesus once asked his disciples in Matthew 16, verses 13 to 17. I don't know if you remember, he said to them, who do you say the son of man is? Hmm. And they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asked, but who say ye, who say ye that I am? When anybody says to you, tell me about your, this church that you go to, what tell me about it? They're saying, so who you say you are? What is your foundation? What is your belief system? Where are you coming from? in terms of your, your faith and your belief? It's a big question to have to answer. Who say ye that I am? And that is the title of my encouragement this morning. 
Because I think we need to spend a little time answering that question. Who are we as Science of Mind students? What do we mean when we say we are religious scientists or studying religious science? Do we individually and collectively have a special mission on the planet at this time? Are we going to use it by sending drum signals from city to city and from town to town? Or are we going to allow our lives to be the message? Are we going to allow our lights to shine? And are we going to become able to explain what we are about and what we believe? Are we able to say, we follow the teachings of Jesus, the master teacher, but we honor all paths to God. I was, if there's only one man when Steve quoted the Quran this morning, I thought, yes. You know, this is, this is how this works. And you know, I can imagine the awkward silence as the disciples puzzled over Jesus' meaning and searched themselves for an answer. But whom do ye say that I am? Until Peter bravely replied, do you remember his reply? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, who is in heaven. Unquote. My friends, the point being made here is that no matter what it is we are appraising, we cannot really know a person by means of our knowledge of his or her background or by any kind of analytical analysis of his or her character. The only correct evaluation of anyone is in terms of what he or she can be, the person's divine potential. And I, oh, I wish you could be with us at Tower Street some Tuesdays, because that is a learning and a training ground for us to begin to be able to look past our, our prejudices and our, our hang-ups and our, our fears to see the divine potential in some very bright, very, very bright, very wonderful expressions of God. And so Jesus was saying to Peter, you didn't arrive at this answer by reason of my personality or even my physical stature or by anything that came from observation. You had a revelation of the divinity within me you have seen the Christ, not by sight, but by insight. By insight, looking inside for the answer. To whom do you say that I am? Now, Peter's inspired words have been taken by traditional Christians to mean that Jesus was God coming down from somewhere out there to live as a man for a while. But look again at this incident, and you will note that it is Peter and not Jesus who is being lauded. Jesus had proved his divinity many, many times by seeing into the hearts of people and drawing out their inner greatness. But now it is Peter who has a flash of spiritual perception and spiritual discernment and who sees beyond the person to the real, to the divine in Jesus. And Peter, in so doing, reveals his own divinity. Because you see, friends, when you look past the outward appearances into the divinity of people, that is also proving your own high consciousness of the divinity of humankind. As the story continues in Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, Jesus is so delighted with this evidence of spiritual insight that he says, quote, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, the Christian church has taken the words of the master teacher literally, so literally, in fact, that St. Peter's church in Rome is reputed to be built on the interred bones of St. Peter. What did Jesus really have in mind, though? First of all, please remember that the man we call Peter was really named Simon. Peter was a nickname used only after this incident. 
The very first time it was used was when Jesus said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The nickname was used, as we say in Jamaica, to big up a quality displayed in the man. The quality was Petros, which in Greek is a term similar to our word faith. And it means literally rock-like steadfastness. Petra, rock-like steadfastness. I find it interesting, you know, as I was writing this, that we also call Jamaica the rock, or say, yeah, Jam Rock. Isn't that interesting? Upon this rock, I will build my church. Anyway, Jesus is praising Simon, now Peter, for being stable and perceptive. And he's saying that it is upon this kind of perception that the church must be built. Now, we must also remember that church did not mean the institution that we have come to know today. For when Jesus used the word, there was no precedent. And the word church really meant called out ones. The word church meant those that are called out. Steve introduced me by saying, I was called. He's right. And when I got called, I said, send me, Lord, but send somebody before so I can get used to the idea. And then I said, look here, I know me call you, or you call me, so take what you get. But knowing that Jesus always dealt with thoughts rather than things, we can see that he was dealing with the aggregation of ideas in spiritual consciousness. Paul caught this meaning too when he declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, quote, Know ye not that ye are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So you are the church, the called out ones. And I want to suggest to you this morning that we are called out to behold the divinity in our fellow men and women. That we are called out to stand firm on a rock of steadfast assurance that God is the only presence and the only power. And that that presence and power must prevail. That the keys to the kingdom, which the master said were in our hands, the kingdom that is right here and now, is our ability to look beyond appearances and to behold the Christ in everyone. Would you turn to your, your neighbor and say, I behold the Christ in you, namaste. I behold the Christ in you, namaste. I behold the Christ in you, Reverend Michael, namaste. Friends, in all experience, life asks the question of you. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And my mother used to say, who the hell do you think you are speaking to me like that, boy? <laughs> and this brings me to your assignment. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is to become still. I love this in our, our responsive reading. It says, if one will set in quiet contemplation of good as an inner experience, he will experience the good which he contemplates. And so your assignment today is to set in quiet contemplation. Take your journal or a sheet of paper and write at the top, Father or Father, Mother, God, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Ask him back the question. And I want you to know that, I want you to write at least 20 responses. Don't stop at 20, you can keep going, but at least 20 to that question. And remember that humanly, you may be physically challenged or experiencing dis-ease or feeling discouraged or insufficient, but this is, this is only one glimpse of the eternal performance of your immortal soul on your journey towards self-mastery, towards being able to look past conditions to see the truth of everyone's divinity. And so you are not the limited person that you may think you are. You are divine. Know ye not that ye are the sons and daughters of the living God. You are what you can be, my friends. And from the standpoint of your inherent divinity, you can be what you already are in the mind of God. For God sees you only as perfect, whole, 
complete and holy. The founder of our great teaching, Dr. Ernest Holmes, said, and I quote, there is hidden within the mind of man a divinity. There is incarnated in you and me that which is an incarnation of God. This divine sonship is not a projection of that which is unlike our nature. It is not a projection of the divine into the human. God cannot project himself outside himself. God can only express himself within himself. Man is not an individual in God. Man is an individualization of God. There is no revelation, Holmes says, higher than the realization of the divinity within us." Unquote. I truly believe, my friends, that when enough of us learn to behold the Christ in all people, we will form a critical mass which will shift the consciousness of humankind so significantly that all races, all religions, all people will honor the divinity in all life and live peacefully together in a world that God has already made to work for everyone. Temple of Light longtime member Joy Lindo sent me a charming story a short while ago by an anonymous author with which I'd like to end my, my encouragement this morning. In an ancient temple, a number of pigeons lived happily on the rooftop. When the renovation of the temple began for the annual temple feast, the pigeons relocated themselves to a church steeple nearby. The existing pigeons in the church accommodated the newcomers very well. But Christmas was nearing and the church was to be given a facelift, so all the pigeons had to move out and look for another place. They were fortunate to find a place in a mosque nearby. The pigeons in the mosque welcomed them happily, but when it was Ramadan time and the mosque had to be repainted, all the pigeons returned to the same ancient temple. One day, the pigeons on, on top witnessed some communal clashes between the townspeople in the market square. A baby pigeon asked the mother pigeon, who are those people, mother? The mother replied, they are human beings. The baby asked, but why are they fighting with each other, mother? And the mother said, those human beings going to the temple are called Hindus. And the people going to the church are called Christians. And the people going to the mosque are called Muslims. Puzzled, the baby pigeon said, why is it so? When we were in the temple, we were called pigeons. When we were in the church, we were called pigeons. And when we were in the mosque, we were called pigeons. Similarly, they should be called just human beings wherever they go. The mother pigeon sighed and she said, you and I and our pigeon friends have experienced God and that's why we are living here in a highly elevated place, <laughs> peacefully. These people are yet to experience God and hence are living below us and fighting and killing each other. Nice story, eh? Friends, when life demands of you, who do you think you are? Speak the word of truth. Stand up, throw your shoulders back, and declare for yourself, I am a spiritual being. I am whole and free. I am confident and capable. I am the master of my life. I am the son or daughter of the living God. Let's do that. Let's stand up and declare our faith. I'll repeat it for you. First, let me ask. Everybody stand, even little ones. Who do you think you are? Say with me, I am a spiritual being. I am whole and free. I am free. I'm confident and capable. I'm confident and capable. I am the master of my life. I am the master of my life. I am the son or daughter of the living God. I am the son or daughter of the living God. And so it is. And so it is. Namaste.